Thank you everyone for joining today's webinar that's brought to you by CT Corp and Hunt and Williams. I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speakers today. Our speakers today is Gus Mambilla and Uriel Mendita. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Uriel Mendieta. I'm a partner in the corporate practice group of Hunt and Williams. A significant portion of my practice focuses on advising clients in connection with cross-border transactions and investments in Latin America. My partner, Gus Mambiela, is in our litigation team, and he focuses on international litigation, also with a focus on Latin America as well as domestic matters. We've been advising clients of that have had questions on Cuba and transactions that had some kind of Cuban nexus over the years. And for the most part, most of the transactions, the analysis has been relatively simple. It's usually the answer is that you can't do it under U.S. laws. Um, whenever we encounter targets in Latin America that might have operations or businesses with Cuba, usually the, the short answer was to segregate and divest the assets prior to moving forward with the transaction. On December 17th, President Obama announced a shift in the U.S. policy towards Cuba. The shift in policy, as part of the shift, the U.S. announced that it would ease certain limitations on travel to Cuba, broaden certain categories of exports, and make financial transactions a little bit easier. The hope is that this was the first step in a process that's going to lead to the normalization of diplomatic relations with Cuba and the easing or end of the embargo. And I think over the last five, six months, we've seen gradual steps in that direction. Um, in January, we had the issuance of new regulations. Um, we've had meetings between Cuba and the U.S. Uh, recently, they, in April, there's a, a new uh, frequently asked questions list that was published, um, which reflected some of this easing. And just recently, the administration began the process of removing Cuba from the list of state sponsors of terrorism. Although there have been you know, some of these small changes, it's, so far it's been very gradual, small changes. For most, the analysis hasn't changed. Um, you still probably can't do business with Cuba. However, these steps are opening the door towards the possibility that in the near future uh, there will be permitted trade with Cuba in a far broader context. And so now the time for companies to start thinking about how and when they would enter Cuba. Uh, what are the practical and legal risks that are involved? And as with any cross-border transaction, the first steps in these analysis is going to be to ensure that the activities that the company wants to conduct are permitted under U.S. law and under Cuban law. Um, companies are going to have to familiarize themselves with the legal regime and the culture of the jurisdiction. Um, companies are also going to have to understand whether their rights and interests are enforceable. And the answer to all of these questions are going to vary depending on the nature of the business. Um, the idea behind this presentation today is to provide a, an overview, an introduction really, to the Cuban legal framework, uh, the different structures for investment, and give a summary about where we are on the U.S. side. <clears throat> I guess at the outset we should note that neither I nor Gus are Cuban lawyers. So our summaries of the Cuban laws have been based on the information that's available and in collaboration with Woody Menendez, a law firm in Spain that has been advising their clients on business with Cuba um, for some time now. And I think that, you know, this type of collaboration is the type of collaboration that U.S. firms are going to be doing as we start, you know, trade with Cuba starts opening up and, and we start advising clients that are evaluating uh, the, the Cuban market simply because for the last 60 years, there has been no trade between U.S. and Cuba, practically speaking. And so the legal contacts and the relationships and the, the knowledge of the market is, is more limited than, other, than in other Latin American jurisdictions. On the other hand, 
there's the rest of the world has been trading with Cuba, so there's plenty of precedent and examples for us to draw upon that's going to facilitate the learning curve. And the legal framework in Cuba we'll find is, is similar to a lot of the other Latin American jurisdictions and Spain in that it's based on the Spanish Civil Code um, with you know changes and adaptations to the Cuban to the Cuban system. Uh, with that, I think we'll go ahead and start. Thanks, Uriel. So uh, I'm Gus Mambiela, a partner at Hunton Williams. As Uriel said, my practice is uh, mostly focused on litigation, but also um, in advising uh, clients with different, you know, Cuba matters over over the years. You know, the question that everyone seems to ask is, is okay, so Cuba's opening up other than maybe a, a demographic of, of Cuban Americans. Why do, you know, why do we really care? And, and I, I think the answer to that is, you know, is a little twofold. I think there's, there's a lot of interest in the business community. I think some of it is, is the, the, the forbidden fruit concept of Cuba that it's been under an embargo and and not been open to U.S. investment, <clears throat> and that uh, U.S. businesses see it as a purely emerging market that's strategically located at the heart of the Caribbean near the U.S., um, and that you know it has a a population of about 11 to million, but its its per capita GDP is basically half of that of some of the other um, you know more developed countries in the region, including Costa Rica, Mexico, and, and Panama. And, but with that said, it's also a country that has a very um, large, um, large amount of natural resources, um, but it's very limited in the, the total amount of, of exports that, um, that it's been uh, sending out to, uh, to the world. Um, basically, Cuba imported about $14 billion in U.S. goods in, in 2013 um, and only exported about, about $5 billion. So, so the question is, you know, if there is a lifting of the, of the U.S. embargo, you know, how, how do we go into the, you know, how do companies go into the Cuban market? What's the framework? Because the, the issue, as with any other emerging uh, economy is what are my legal protections? What's the legal framework that I have to work under? And is Cuba really open to to foreign investment aside from uh, the U.S. side impediments? And I, I think when you start looking at the U.S. at the Cuban legal system, they've uh, they've started to take steps, um, beginning you know from as far back as, as 2012 and even a little bit before then to take steps to make their legal system and their economy friendlier uh, to foreign investment. They've, uh, they've passed several regulations, most recently with the enactment in last year of a new foreign investment law and some ancillary regulations supporting uh, that investment law. In, uh, in 2013, they had also created a special economic development zone in, uh, in Mariel, um, which is a port outside of Havana, and with the idea of of inducing foreign investment into the country, and um, they have also taken steps to to put out a sort of a menu of of items in industries where they're looking for foreign foreign direct investment, um, which I think is important and shows a willingness from the Cuban side, um, at least currently. Uh, to accept this type of investment, so 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 we sort of lay out some of these reforms and changes that are going on uh, in the Cuban legal system, and and then uh, and then we turn to some of the areas, some of the industries of focus where um, the Cubans have identified that they are seeking investment and seeking um, you know participation from the foreign markets, not only from the U.S. side. Um, and so if you look at these, they, you know, they seem intuitively correct, the areas that, you know, a country like Cuba would, would want um, to further develop. You know, at the top of the list is, is tourism and real estate, uh, infrastructure and construction, um, telecom and IT, transportation, agriculture, uh, biotechnology and pharmaceuticals, um, which is, and I think that's, 
that's a, uh, an important one for the Cubans because that's really a place where they've focused in during the pendency of the U.S. In embargo and have had lots of um, foreign companies, the French in, in particular, working in Cuba, um, trying to, to commercialize some of the, the research that the Cubans have been doing. Uh, seven, you have energy, uh, obviously, with the, with the situation in, in Venezuela. Um, the Cubans would be very happy to have uh, some level of energy independence and are really looking uh, into renewable energies. And uh, then you have just general mechanical, chemical, electronic, and, and light industries. Uh, what they did is in, in November of 2014, they put out a, a portfolio of different investment opportunities um, that relate to these sectors where they're looking for investment. And uh, the Economic Development Zone at, Mar at Marielle is also subdivided um, into, different, um, into different areas, each of which is meant to house and promote um, some of these sectors. So focusing in a little bit on the Economic Development Zone, um, which I think is, is sort of an important development in the, in the legal system um, because it shows that the, the willingness from the Cuban side um, to accept foreign direct investment. Um, I, I think you know, one of the complaints you've, you know, we've heard historically um, from companies that have been doing business in Cuba, you know, the non-U.S. Non companies, is that, that because of the bureaucratic structure of the government and because of the way the foreign investment laws were structured, it could take a very long time to get an investment approved. Um, sometimes, you know, the hurdles were insurmountable. And the, and the new 2014 investment law and the economic development zone are basically aimed at trying to correct this perception. I think it's fairly early on for both of those, and um, it'll take some time to see how it is that, that this will develop. But at least on this, you see a, um, a conceptual willingness from the Cubans um, with respect to, to, the, uh, to the issue of foreign direct investment. Um, so with that, we get to our first uh, poll question here, which uh, you uh, have to answer for CLE purposes. Um, and that first question is, are you currently doing business in Cuba? And we'll give you a couple of seconds to answer that. Okay, so I, I think how, as we probably would have anticipated, the vast majority of people on this call are not doing business in Cuba currently um, because it, it is a, a U.S. side presentation. But, you know, I, I think just from, you know, from the level of interest in the, in the marketplace, I, I think that's sort of an answer that given um, where people are seeing the Obama administration and, and some of the legislation uh, that's pending before Congress, uh, may be evolving over the next, uh, you know, months to, to years. And, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Uriel to talk a little bit about the, the actual corporate structures that can be used under the, for, under the Cuban foreign investment law. Thanks, Gus. So there are three types of vehicles that, that can be used to invest in Cuba. The first is an international economic association contract, which is really like a, like a management agreement, and it's, it's relatively popular in the hospitality sector, in the hotel sector. Um, about 28% of the foreign investment that goes into, into basically this type of, of structure goes into the hotel area. Uh, the other one is a full foreign capital company, which is the formation of an actual entity in Cuba. This is a very small percentage of foreign investment in Cuba. And the third is a joint venture company uh, in which a foreign company enters into a joint venture with a Cuban party, predominantly a state-owned enterprise. And this is the most popular form or the most prevalent form of vehicle 
for investments in Cuba. Yeah, and just, just adding on to what Uriel was saying, is is historically the, the structure of the joint venture is is the most is the most popular and, and almost the vast majority of the investments in Cuba have been through joint ventures, and in those joint ventures, um, the Cuban state entity um, has been the major the majority uh, partner in the joint venture. Right. I think that based on anecdotal evidence, we've seen that there's a strong preference on the Cuban side to retain a majority mm -hmm. of any joint venture that they go into and control, which obviously presents a lot of challenges from the structuring side and the protection of the mm -hmm. investor rights. Mm -hmm. but, but I think one of the interesting things going forward um, with respect to the implementation of the new investment law is, is that if you read the investment law in its strict sense, uh, the Cuban law allows for uh, individuals within the, in, within the country to form cooperatives, which are not government entities, um, for certain specific purposes allowed, allowed under the law, you know, agriculture and, and, some other, and in some other areas. And I think under the, uh, the reading of the law, um, the, in, when, in the interpretation of what is a Cuban entity, these cooperatives um, you know, would be defined as Cuban entities, and eventually at, at some point you could see the creation of joint venture vehicles between a foreign entity and the, and the Cuban cooperatives. As we move over to the next slide, we've, we've tried to put together some, some of the information that we gathered on the, basically the investments by entity type and you'll see 51% of the investments were through joint venture entities. Um, another 40-some percent were through different contracts, either a management production contract, a hotel management contract, um, cooperative production contracts, which, as we'll talk about a little bit further along, you know, these contracts all require some type of investment from the foreign partner but they end up working much more as a services arrangement. Um, so moving on in particular, with respect to the IAC, the Economic Association contract, the general characteristics. It's a contract. It requires a public deed and it has to be registered with a commercial registry. There's a wide latitude as to what the terms and conditions are. They're going to be set forth in the contract. Um, most, uh, not, I don't know if most, but a majority of the investments in the hotel sector have been done through management contracts, in which typically the, the state-owned enterprise retains the ownership of the, of the building, the land, and the foreign partner comes in, invests you know, in a renovation, a refurbishment, and gets a right to operate the property under a particular brand or the like for a period of time. The next type of entity is the full foreign capital company. This is basically creating a, an entity or a branch within Cuba. It basically tracks the, the procedure that you'd find in other Latin American countries. You have to form the entity, register it with a commercial registry, and have a office, you know, Estatuto Sociales, the typical documentation that you find with a company. The third is the, the joint venture vehicle, which is the predominant form of investment. Uh, it's, it's a separate legal entity, so it's an incorporated joint venture. As we mentioned, the Cuban partner is typically the majority uh, owner. The strong preference on the Cuban side, not surprisingly, is to have the joint venture and the dispute resolution provisions governed by Cuban law. Um, it has to have a fixed time frame. And this is interesting because what, what we understand is that 
most of these joint ventures have a term of 10, 15 years, at which point the investment has to be renewed with, by the mutual agreement of the parties. Given that you have the state actor on the other side, this gives them a lot of power to wind down the investment just on its own terms after a set period of time. One of, one of the things that, that we found in reviewing different types of joint ventures um, that have been that have been formed going to Cuba is that there, there appears to be a strong preference on the Cuban side to uh, go for much larger projects. Um, most of the projects that they put out on the joint venture side are for require significant investments in capital. Um, they're looking for they're looking for home runs basically rather than smaller projects. Um, some of the examples of the, of the joint ventures over the years that have been successful in Cuba include um, nickel mining with uh, Sherrod, a Canadian company. That was a 50-50 joint venture. It now provides one of the biggest flows of hard currency for the Cuban government. Um, there have been a, there is a joint venture with British Tobacco, which has been used to market um, Cuban tobacco internationally. Um, and some of the Sol Melia on the hotel side, one of the largest operators in Cuba is Sol Melia. And although they've done a number of projects through management contracts, they've also entered into joint ventures with some of the Cuban state-owned hotel companies that have been organized through joint ventures. Um, you know, Yuri, one of the things I'll say about, you know, just so, sort of anecdotally on the, on the share it thing and the share it investment is that, that in, in addition to just, you know, making their commercial investment into the country, um, share it has also uh, made some, you know, social investments um, within the area where, where they're doing business and, and when, where they're mining. And I think sort of this sort of second level of sort of Investing themselves into into the Cuban um, landscape is is one of the is one of the reasons that people point to as to why uh, they've been successful uh, in Cuba and have been able to operate there, uh, you know, for for a number of years. Whereas other joint ventures in in different areas, in, including you know, manufacturer of consumer goods or or similar, um, have have failed. Yeah, and I think that that's very important because it shows the importance of creating goodwill. I mean, Sherrod has been able to, in the areas in which they operate, invest in schools, upgrades to local hospitals. They've been able to have good relations with the different unions, and all of that has helped them build some goodwill, which would appear to help their the operation of their joint venture. Some of, the, some of the issues on the joint venture side is um, the cash contributions are going to be calculated in Cuban currency. This lends itself, you know, the Cuban government sets the currency conversions. Uh, they set the rates. So there's an opportunity there for negotiation and also to try to identify a way to mitigate risk that the investor is going to have in investing, uh, in contributing cash, and basically what the reference points are going to be for the cash contributions. There's often in these in the actual in joint ventures that involve manufacturing or real estate, um, you're going to have often lands will be contributed by the Cuban partner to the joint venture. Most land in Cuba is not. Uh, transferable. Until recently, um, Cuban citizens couldn't transfer land. Now they've they've actually amended the law to allow uh, Cuban citizens to sell their land to other Cuban citizens. But given the limitations on transfer of real estate, there's really no market for land. And in these joint ventures, one of the interesting things is that as the Cuban government contributes 
you know, often contributes land or some type of building into the joint venture, they're also setting, a, the Ministry of Finance also sets the value of that land, which would be very difficult to provide a uh, reference point for. Um, needless to say, the, the sort of takeaway from all of this is that there has to be a lot of attention pay, played to what is the dispute resolution mechani mechanics in the joint venture agreement, an emphasis on trying to provide for some type of appraisal or evaluation mechanics that are outside of the structure of the Cuban government, and um, to the extent possible to put the dispute resolution um, mechanisms outside of the Cuban legal framework. And talking with both Uria and some other law firms that we've spoken to that have represented clients in Cuba, it's, a, it's mixed. Their, their, their experiences on being able to obtain that depends on the investor, the type of leverage they have, and the, the, the basically the willingness of the uh, Cuban government to, to accede to those to those uh, requests. And uh, this uh, this next slide just recaps the the sort of governance structure of the JV. It's very similar to the framework used in Spain and Latin American countries. You'll have the joint venture agreement. You're going to have some bylaws. There's going to be shareholder meetings. Uh, you'll have a management, uh, a board of directors. Um, yeah, and then I, you know I think then we go into sort of you know. The Cuban government requires approval of the investments. You know, the new investment law in the, in the Mariel Zone are aimed at um, streamlining the, the process. Um, we sort of lay out some of the, the timelines there uh, for, different, for different approvals. It, but you have to keep in mind that, uh, you know, there hasn't been a huge level of, of direct investment into Cuba and that uh, it is a, a bureaucratic state, centrally controlled government, and they, they're still working through uh, exactly, uh, you know, the implementation process on, on some of these things. Uh, but I, I think particularly with, with Marielle, I think the idea was uh, that it's, it's sort of a, a single window system where you can deal with one authority in terms of trying to get your, your investment approved uh, you know, like I had said previously, you know, Mariel is, it's about 45 miles outside of Havana, or 45 kilometers outside of Havana, I'm sorry, and it's uh, about a, a 500 square kilometer zone that they, that they have created there, and, and then it's, it's divided into the different 11 zones with the idea that um, they can incubate um, additional investment within that zone. The, uh, the employment within that zone is not limited to, to Cubans. Um, one of the things that didn't change under the existing law, but that I think a lot of out, you know, outsiders sort of point to as, as one of the, the next changes that the Cubans need to make in order to really attract uh, foreign direct investment, is that the foreign companies still cannot uh, directly employ the Cuban, you know, the Cuban individuals. Uh, that they want working, they still have to employ them through the through the Cuban government, um, and the Cuban government takes you know takes a part of whatever the salaries are that are paid to the uh, to the Cuban individuals. So that's one of those uh, areas where we'll have to you know wait and see how that sort of sort of plays out. Um, I, you know, I, I think there's you know there's a you know there's there's you know there's risk in Cuba, there's risk in in all emerging in all emerging markets. Um, but I, I think this is sort of a, a you know a plan and, and C type of approach, um, and I think it's something where you know in, in in advising clients you know mostly what you know what we're we're seeing and what we're telling them is if you're really interested in, in the Cuban market you need to you need to go down there in and the, you know the very documentation that's been put out by Marielle it, that's basically what what they say you know. To say, do you want to invest? Come down here and tell us what you want. You know what you want to do, and we'll uh, and then we'll let you know whether it's something that we're interested in or not. Um, and I think part of the idea of them putting out the menu was sort of to, to streamline um, the investments 
and try and focus in companies on the types of projects um, that they want to be pre-approved. I mean, the the at a conference I was at with the uh, the, the Cuban ambassador to Spain, he said, look, "Look, we're not close to other ideas and other investments, but I can tell you what's on the menu. It's what's been approved already, and so if you start there." You, you have a, a leg up on, on the process. Uh, if you come with an idea that's outside of there, you're gonna have to work through the, the approval process a little bit more diligently to, to, uh, to, get, that, to get that approved. Um, so, and then, you know, we also laid out a couple of the, you know, the tax advantages of the, of the development zone and the changes uh, as a result of the investment law, just to have some general, um, you know, such, Everyone can have a general idea of what of what those are, and and I think you know another area where you know if we're talking about risk and risk mitigation is you know I go into Cuba, what kind of protection am I going to have for my intellectual property, for my copyrights, and and the Cuban legal system does protect intellectual property and does protect copyright laws, and there is uh, uh, registration processes um, for your for your intellectual property. Um, and I think you know the other the other big question in, in everybody's mind with respect to Cuba is all right. So I go down there and and they just you know what protections do I have from from expropriation? This is a government that you know already you know expropriated property from its own citizens and from from nationals you know and from all the foreigners when it came in. You know what protections do I have from that happening in the future? And, and you know I think. You know, in terms of of the joint venture vehicles, uh, there's certain um, you know choice you know that I look at from the from a litigation standpoint is you know what laws are applicable, what dispute resolution provisions, and you're not limited only to the application of, of Cuban law in your choice of law provision in your joint venture or your contracts. They do allow um, for choosing a a different law. Um, of course, if you're dealing with the Cuban government, you always have that as as a natural impediment that they're going to prefer to, to have their own law apply. And, and the Cubans will also agree to international arbitration in their, in their uh, contracts. Um, they, have, you know, they have in the past participated in international arbitrations and are, and are still participating um, in international arbitrations. And that takes us to our second poll question here for, uh, for CLE pur purposes. And, and you know what sector of the Cuban economy um, are you analyzing for investment? And there's a couple of choices there, and we'll we'll give you a little bit to answer. All right, and then so we'll click over to the the poll results here. And it looks like uh, the famous other is is uh, is leading the pack here, um, but with tourism uh, very close behind, which which would seem to be a natural fit. Um, and I, I you know I think tourism obviously is is an is an interesting one, and uh, where you know it's a natural fit. Into what the Cuban market is looking, but I just uh, you know we're going to turn to the U.S. law and 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 I, there's a pending question there about travel to uh, to Cuba, which we'll, we'll answer. But I just, I just wanted to hit on a couple more points in terms of of foreign investment protection. Uh, Cuba also is is a party to a number of of bilateral investment treaties um, with with 71 uh, foreign countries. Um, and these bilateral investment treaties are, you know, similar to those that are enforced um, in other countries where they protect uh, foreign investment in the in the country. Uh, the actual uh, investment law passed last, you know, passed in 2014, also uh, protects uh, foreign investments and and expropriation um, of the capital of the foreign investor. Um, but as as always, you know, that that's something. That has to be dealt. You know that if you get in that situation, you're obviously dealing with a governmental event, and uh, you're you're better off with whatever international treaty protection you might have that you can seek outside the realm of of the in, of the government protection that's seeking to expropriate your property. 
So I think with that, we'll turn um, a little bit to the current uh, limiting environment that exists here in, uh, in the U.S. Um, I may have said this before, but you know, even with the embargo, the U.S. is still in the top 10 in uh, countries importing products to Cuba. Um, so I, I think that's, that's sort of interesting, and in terms of, of viewing the future and the future prospects of the Cuban economy for U.S. companies, uh, even with all the restrictions in place, the U.S. is still one of the top 10 importers into Cuba. I think as we move on to the U.S. regulations, we can address the, the, the first question that we received, which is that <clears throat> is non-business related tourism travel to Cuba from the U.S. now permitted? And the answer to that is no. Um, what the new regulations did do was facilitate travel to Cuba under a number of authorized exceptions, most of them dealing with business purpose or some type of purpose to establish more people-to-people -people contact with Cuba or to promote arts or culture. Um, what the new regulations did was if you're under one of these 12 different categories, of permitted travel, you'll have a general license. You don't have to request a specific license in order to travel to Cuba. I think just from a high level, as, as we as we mentioned on at the outset, you know, the, the changes to date are, are still very limited for most businesses. I mean most services and sales are still barred. Um, Activities that are permitted, most of them still require a license, um, and it's not that easy to get these licenses, um, although it's becoming easier in certain categories. So what have, what have the, the new regulations done? Um, the new regulations have gone ahead and, you know, Create additional tra uh, opportunities and travel-related businesses in the telecom sector, in agriculture, um, in certain financial services, in certain en renewable energy and environmental protection categories. You know, and and, and for for me, from a, you know, just from a purely comparative perspective, um, when you start looking at these categories of of a, you know of allowable or where the, the where the U.S. embargo has shifted, I, I think in a lot of ways they do fit into the the categories of, on the menu that the Cubans have put out, where they are looking for for foreign direct investment. Now, I, I think just to be clear, I, you know, and I think OPEC has been very clear on this, is that you know foreign direct investment is not is not allowed by U.S. persons into into Cuba at this time. I think, sir, you know, I think it's important, you know, in, in analyzing where we are and where, um, you know, where we'll be. I think you need, you know, you need to understand sort of some of the underlying premises of of the embargo and what the president was able to do in in December and why he was able to do it. If you look at sort of the, you know, the embargo is a series of is enacted under a series of of laws passed by Congress. Um, but also under uh, regulations uh, passed both by the, the Commerce Department and, uh, and by Treasury uh, in, in OFAC regulations. Um, but within those statutory enactments of the, of the embargo, part of what was authorized is for the President to take actions which would help promote civil society and free enterprise and, and a democratic Cuba and I, I think many of, of the changes that were enacted, um, you know, in, in you know, announced in December, enacted in January, and of which I, th I think are continued to be clarified um, through today. You know, the underlying purpose is, is the underlying stated purpose is this, to promote, you know, private enterprise and, and to promote the, um, you know, a, you know the democratic a democratic government in Cuba. Um, I, th I think in terms of the democratic government in Cuba, that sort of as a 
as a talking point has been moved away from, but that's that's sort of where the the law leads you. Um, you know, the Cuban the Cuban legal system does allow individuals um, to operate their own bus- you know their own businesses now in certain select uh, categories. Uh, these are what are referred to in in Cuba as the the cuenta propistas. Um, they're basically you know people that are working on for their own account. And in most of the changes that occurred were designed to allow companies to deal directly with these cuenta propistas. Now, you know, for, for more, most large multinationals or for, uh, for, you know, for larger companies looking for economies of scale, this may not necessarily work because you're, you're looking in most instances as, you know, at, indiv- you know, at individuals that are either producing something for, ex- you know, for export or whether, or that they're providing some service in Cuba and looking to import something uh, to support that, uh, to support that, but but I think it's you know you know as Uriel said when we started we're looking at, at a process here, at um, at steps, and I think with every new step with every new meeting, uh, the possibility of of a lifted embargo becomes more of a of a reality, and and like he said you know if your company is interested you need to you need and should start planning now. Um, so we, you know, here we just lay out some of the sources of the of the embargo uh, for you, um, coming from the Department of Commerce, from from BIS specifically, um, who enforces those regulations, and and from OFAC, and and sort of the, the basic elements of the sanction regime, which are in place with Cuba, um, that they prohibit dealing in, in property, the prohibition on importation of goods, and a prohibition on, on exporting, which which basically covers most uh, most commercial activity uh, with Cuba. <clears throat> I think we covered just a little bit of this, so I'll just flip through here, you know, some. So, you know, what what um, part of what the, the changes that occurred in December is that we went from a system where in certain instances licenses were required to now where there are specific licenses exceptions in the in the regulations, um, you know, for example, in, with telecommunications devices, that's one of the areas where there's been a broader opening uh, in terms of what can be done with with Cuba, and we've seen that in in companies, you know, moving into the market and, and signing inter- interconnectivity agreements with the Cuban government. Um, you've also seen some some internet-based companies. Announcing that they're that they're going to be providing services directed at the Cuban market where they weren't where they weren't doing that before. I think interesting. Uh, yesterday uh, there was a bipartisan bill presented, um, which relates directly to the telecommunications in Cuba, and basically looks to lift the embargo with respect to telecommunications and telecommunications infrastructure. So that we're, you know, we would move out of a system of licensing and licensing exceptions um, into a an open, um, you know, an open trade system uh, with Cuba with respect to telecommunications. And I think this is a good example of, a, of an area where there's 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 an alignment on both sides as far as both need and opportunity here. I mean, on, on the Cuban side, you know, the infrastructure and in telecom is 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 deficient. Um, it's doesn't meet the needs of modern sort of 4G systems or, you know, they need more data cables. There's only one undersea cable that goes into Cuba. Um, on the U.S. side, you know, the telecom sector is one where opening up restrictions on telecom will facilitate access to information on the island, better Internet, uh, which also, you know, tends to support both private enterprise as well as um, uh, Increase um, participation by the uh, by the population. So then, some you know some of the other areas, you know, consumer communication devices that falls under telecom also. And then you look at other areas where there is a, a need in the Cuban economy, and with a lifting of the embargo, I, I think you know there would probably be a lot more interest from the U.S. side. But as it stands, uh, you know, for example, building materials, equipment, and tools. You know, there's a limitation on what it, you know, where it can be used. You know, it can only be used for for privately owned buildings, 
and for private sector, social, or, or, rec or recreational use. So, you know, while there was an opening there, it, um, you know, it doesn't cover a broad-based opening with respect to, uh, you know, import of those materials into Cuba. Similarly, with tools and equipment uh, for the private sector, that's, that's only pri the private agricultural sector, that would include the, um, you know, any government-owned entities. And, and I think what we're, you know, what, you know, what is open to, to definition there, and I think where, you know, we're still in the gray areas and working things out is in terms of, you know, cooperatives and other entities where there may be some sort of quasi-governmental participation, but it's, you know, it's run by private individuals and, and owned by private individuals, whether uh, the government is going to allow for that. And, and, and I think that that's just one area where, where it's, you know, I, I think if you have an interest, you just need to consider it and, and present it to the, you know, to OFAC and, and to BIS and determine whether uh, your proposal is acceptable to them or not. In, and, you know, the other change, you know, these, the first couple are licensing exceptions, and then you had a move to a general uh, policy of approval. So you still need a, a license, but there's a general policy of approval enunciated. And these are in areas um, that are deemed to protect the environment of the, of the U.S. and international air quality. So, for example, renewable energy and energy efficiencies. And, and as um, I had said earlier in the presentation, that's another area that falls squarely within the needs and, and wants of, of, the, uh, of the Cuban economy and, and the Cuban government. I think it's also, it's also a sector in which, on the renewable side, where in, in Latin America you often see involvement, financing from multilateral financial institutions, which one of the steps that you would you know, expect to see as a gradual normalization relations is that the U.S. will not block, you know, moves, you know, in the, by other member countries to have Cuba admitted to, you know, the, the IDB or the IFC or to obtain, you know, World Bank financing. Uh, which will also facilitate investment in these sectors. Um, I think we've seen in, in a lot of jurisdictions that the multilaterals are some of the first financing sources to go into a jurisdiction because they have a higher tolerance for risk. They have um, different purpose and can sort of set the groundwork and be some of the first boots on the ground when it comes to uh, financing some of these larger scale projects. Yeah, and in terms of some of the other changes, you know, Uriel um, spoke about this earlier in terms of of the, the changes in travel and, and sort of, you know, tying into what I had said earlier in terms of if you're interested, you need to eventually get, you know, get down there and and interact with the Cubans, engage the level of interest there, you know, and, your, and how that intersects with your risk tolerance. Um, but so so the question that arises is well can I can I go down on a tra trade delegation can I travel um, down to Cuba can me and you know members of the of the of the company travel down to Cuba and um, you know there is that, and as that is generally covered by a general license and OFAC has also put out you know an answer to a frequently asked question where they specifically cover that and basically say you know if you if you meet the criteria of the general licenses and the general licenses that that most frequently apply or is the one where, where you're allowed to travel for market research, commercial marketing, sales negotiation, um, or services of, of items that are consistent with the export or re-export license of, uh, of commerce, or which authorize you know, professional research or professional meetings in Cuba, and you're there on a full-time schedule to perform these activities, then yes, you can go down on on a trade you know on a trade meeting, and so so you know in considering you know moving forward as a practical step, I think you need to look at whether what you want to do falls in within the general license exception for travel, and if it does, uh, then you can move forward with organizing your trip. Now, if you're, you are taking a trade trip, you you will need to get a visa from the from the Cuban government. And that requires uh, submitting a sort of an application to them to say that you're going down there for business purposes, and then they'll evaluate what your stated purpose is, 
um, you know, with whom you're, you're meeting and then either approve or, or deny your visa depending on whether they, they see this as something that's beneficial to them um, or not. Now, in terms of, you know, as Uriel said, it's one of the areas where there has been the largest uh, opening is in telecommunications. Um, and there you do have uh, the ability to sell to the Cuban government-owned, operated, and controlled companies, whereas in most other sectors, you still don't have that, that ability. Uh, and then there is also regulations which allow for the, uh, okay, well, that, yeah, and then there are certain categories of, of goods that were uh, able to be exported to Cuba prior to December 17th, and those continue to be allowable goods for export to Cuba. Um, there are certain requirements and, type, and the types of goods, mostly agricultural commodities, uh, fall within uh, that, uh, that definition. But, okay, you want to do... I think as we move on to the sort of financing side, you know, generally um, the financing is still extremely limited. And in addition to financing from U.S. institutions being limited, for, as part of the regulations on the U.S. side relating to Cuba, um, the U.S. executive directors and many of the multilateral financial institutions have also are required to vote against uh, the admission of Cuba into such institutions until there's some kind of democratic change or a change in, in U.S. legislation. Um, and this covers the, the IMF, the, the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency, so a lot of the entities that you would see financing projects in other Latin American jurisdictions. Yeah, and I think there, you know, I, I think if some people that look carefully at those laws say that, you know, similar to what the president did uh, with the embargo and, uh, and lifting certain categories on, on December 12th um, in order to promote, you know, trade and civil society. And in Cuba, you know, if you look specifically at the, at, at the requirements of those laws, there would, we, there would be a way for the administration to comply with the letter of the law, but, but still allowing Cuba to join uh, those, those organizations. In, and I think that would be a, a significant step, you know, for the Cubans if they're able to obtain financing uh, from multilateral organizations. You know, the other thing that, that's allowable um, and of interest is microfinance activity is allowed uh, with respect to the private sector. So that may be also an area where if you are, um, you know, interested in, in the Cuban market, there may be a way um, to you know to invest there through some of this uh, micro uh, finance finance activity and and but you know in keeping all of, you know keeping all of this in mind uh, in addition to you know the regulation on what can be exported you still have your OFAC regulations um, your office of foreign asset control which prohibit um, you know certain payments from from sanctioned countries including Cuba and at all you know at all instances you need to be mindful I think you know Sort of my my you know, warning to to most is just because you know the White House wants there to be you know business with Cuba and increased trade and, and normalization of, di of diplomatic relationships, you should not assume that the regulators are not going to apply their regulations the way as the way written. Uh, that that would be a uh, an incorrect assumptions to work from, and in terms of making your business decisions, you need to make sure that you are at all points compliant with those regulations, irrespective of, of the stated policy goals of the administration. And so we have our third uh, CLE question here. Uh, Would you be more likely to invest in Cuba directly or through a joint venture? We'll just give you a couple of minutes or a couple of seconds to answer that.
All right, and so I think the answer there is mostly through through joint ventures um, as opposed through through direct investment. So I just you know I, I think as we're getting near the end here, just wanted to give a little bit more perspective on on sort of the the view here, a little bit short term and 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 long term instead of you know being wed to our slides. And obviously, if there's any questions, feel free to submit them via the chat, and we'll try and answer them here in the last couple of of, uh, of minutes. But you know, I think what we're looking at here, um, you know, there isn't you know there's an election in the not too uh, distant future, and there is some party politics surrounding the um, whether the the embargo will continue in place or not. But, but I, I think even in terms of a best case scenario here, you know, you're, you're looking at, at a you know 12 to 18 month sort of window before there's I think there's any real significant changes um, that are in any way broad based. I think you know you, you may you may see some bipartisan movement on limited you know on limited bills and limited legal changes. You know, as for example, the telecom bill that was presented yesterday. Or some broader base um, lift of the travel ban, um, you know, before uh, you know next next year's election. So, but but I think you need to keep that in mind in terms of planning and what the you know what your potential timing is for investment in into into Cuba. And, and I think that it's probably more likely that we'll see continued gradual steps and opening up of sectors, sometimes in conjunction. Um, rather than just one big change from one day to the next. Um, I think both on the Cuban side, um, I'm not sure whether or not the Cuban side would, is prepared to handle a uh, complete opening on the, on the, uh, the complete elimination of the U.S. embargo right away um, and an influx of business. On the U.S. side, I think that as you see these incremental steps, um, increasing people-to-people -people contact, increasing the ability of people to and companies to go in and see the Cuban market. I think it creates momentum that helps facilitate, um, you know, the momentum for change on the U.S. side. And so I think, for example, uh, easing or lifting the travel ban in conjunction with making it easier for some, um, you know, investments uh, or agreements between uh, cruise operators and things like that are things that could work um, to facilitate additional investment or ease into investment in Cuba while also waiting to see whether or not there's reciprocal moves on the Cuban side. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and, and like, like Uriel said, this is a process. I think, you know, the next step in the process is, is, is this, you know, it's probably this week. Um, you know, there is a meeting on Thursday of the diplomatic groups from both sides, and I, I you know, the the sound bites coming out before that meeting seem to indicate that opening of embassies may not be too far away. You know, the Cubans apparently have been able to secure a bank um, that is willing to handle their accounts, which was one of the big sticking points. Um, with them uh, opening up an embassy in uh, in the U.S. and so you know and then you have the official lift you know taking them off of the terrorism list, um, which happens uh, at the end of this month, and, and I think both of those are steps which are being viewed favorably by the Cubans, and I, but there still is some give and take on on their end, and there, while there's still a lot left to be seen as to how the reactions are and how this will evolve over. Over the time period, I think you know, going back to my initial, my initial point is that you know that there is a market there. There is a market for U.S. you know that that could be developed by U.S. companies that is geographically uh, close to the U.S. and and centrally located within uh, Latin and within Latin America, and therefore, I think that explains you know why why we have all this interest. Uh, and I think with that, if there's, you know, any, you know, we're happy to take any questions that anyone might have, um, or otherwise, you know, we thank you for, for participating. Thank you. Thank you, guys. We'll go ahead and start off with the CLE questions. 
Please remember, in order to receive CLA, you must answer the survey question. First question, please rate today's webinar. Moving on to our second CLE evaluation question, please rate the overall quality, one being the lowest and five being the highest. Our third CLE question, please rate the written materials, one being the lowest, five being the highest. And our last question, please rate today's instructors, one being the lowest, five being the highest. That does conclude today's webinar, and we thank you for participating in our webinar that's brought to you by CT Corporation and Hunt and Williams. I will go ahead and leave up um, the slides so that you can download in the resource widget, you can download the speaker bios, the slides, and also if you need to fill out the CLE evaluation if you participated as a group or you were not able to answer the CLE questions for the survey that we just answered, please download that and send that in with the next 24 hours to get your CLA credit. If you participate as a group, we'll also need you to download the sign-in sheet. Make sure you print that really clear and email that over to cls-claycredit at walterscooler.com. We will get your certificates um, sent out. If you're in the state of California, New York, your certificates will be sent in within 30 days. And upon Upon completion of our webinar today, you'll receive a certificate of participation within one week. We do thank everyone for attending today's webinar, and we will conclude our call at 2.05 Eastern Time. Thank you, and have a great day.
This does conclude today's call. We will disconnect. Thank you.